cover quite a bit from chapters 4 to 6 here. But I feel like we need to see a lot of this. So I'm going to actually read a section in 4, highlight 5, and a section in 14 of, uh, of chapter uh, 6. But before we do that, let's just quickly review where we've been. We've looked at the first three chapters of Nehemiah so far. On a four-week study, we're at number three of four. So in the first three weeks, we've really been looking at the development of a vision. The development of Nehemiah's vision in chapters one to three. And here's just some highlights of what we've looked at. Again, I would encourage you to read through it, study it, and see how this might apply within your own life and with the life of our church. His vision came. Do you remember what it came from? It wasn't him sitting on a beach somewhere and reading his Bible and and just enjoying the, the beauty of it came from what? There was one word we used. Anybody remember it? Make me, somebody, somebody like warm my heart right now. They got it. Anybody remember? Huh? If, if Katie's shaking her head. No, that's, we're in trouble. We are in trouble if Katie doesn't know. It's the word burden. Does anybody know what it is? Burden. burden. Yeah, Katie's right. You got it. So I'm so happy that people remembered what we talked about two weeks ago and reviewed last week. But his, his vision came from a burden. He heard bad reports of what was going back with his, with his, with his heritage, his people in, in, in Jerusalem, that the walls were not rebuilt, and it came out of a burden, and he immediately did what when he was faced with this burden? He began to write down notes and develop a plan, or he prayed. Awesome. We're going to see that again. So he, he was faced with a burden. He immediately prayed. He did prayer. He did fasting, and then he began to respond, and his prayer started to shape his response. Part of his response then involved him listening and watching. He wasn't jumping ahead and not getting ahead of God. And it was further, further developed that we looked last week through hard work, through intentional planning, through careful communication. This wasn't just something he just kind of jumped into. And finally, it was put into effect last week, we saw, through the efforts of a big team with small, specific kind of roles. This was a huge vision. There was a lot of stuff happening, and Nehemiah needed a big team of a lot of different people doing a lot of little kinds of things to make the whole thing come together. I couldn't help. I, I know I'm, I hinted with some vision stuff last week with us, but it's, if you've participated at all in our soccer camp, it, it's, it's like that. Vince made a comment that really hit me after, out of our soccer camp uh, a week or two after camp this year, which if, if it was just Scott out there with, with uh, 202 kids, it, it would be a nightmare. Now, some of you might then be saying, I didn't really do much at soccer camp. Like, all I did was give a cup of water to people as they were thirsty. Or somebody might say, all I did was walk around with like four kids. We cannot do that camp if we didn't have the 100, 103 volunteers working small little roles to make the big thing what it was. That's what Nehemiah is doing. Now, we, we, we saw these guys last week, and here's where we're going to pick up again. You remember what, what they were called? Surely you remember this point. You don't remember burdens. You don't remember other stuff, but remember the opponents last week. Nobody remembers what we called the opponents last week? The buttheads, Yeah. I knew Rose would get this one. (laughs) Buttheads. Not B-U-T-T, but B-U-T. Every time that Nehemiah wanted to do something, Nehemiah was doing this, the wall was being rebuilt, but Symbolic started getting away and getting angry. Now watch the pattern that we're going to see because here we see these buttheads in full force. And and we're going to see this kind of dance of the actions of the opponents versus Nehemiah's response. The actions and the words of the opponents, the buttheads versus Nehemiah's response. So let's read chapter 4. And just to get us so we can then kind of process it a second, let's read verses 1 to 9. We'll read that as one chunk together here. I'll I'll read it if you want to follow along. Chapter 4 of Nehemiah 1 to 9 says this. Now, now this is coming right out of the context of all the people doing all the individual work. The work's going. Everything's starting to really move now. Now, when Sambalat heard that we we were building the wall, he was angry. He was greatly enraged and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, Yes, what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. 
I'm telling you right now, highlight that one because that one we're going to come back to at something next week. Even if they get this thing done, even if a little tiny fox would climb up on that wall, it will crumble. Verse 4, hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt. Let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall. And all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Verse 7, but... When Sambalan and Tobiah, the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that they were, the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward, that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. We'll stop there, but the rest of that chapter then details some specific kinds of ways that Nehemiah protected and guarded. So it might have been in one spot of the wall where I'm now working on the wall. He put the person who was working next to me as a guard. Scott's going to work on a wall. Rachel's standing there. She's obviously stronger than you, so we're going to give her a shield and a sword, and she's going to watch your back. And so that's what Nehemiah chapter 4 then details the rest of it, to protect what we're doing. The only other thing they add in there is the blowing of a trumpet. If there's, if there's some like really crazy stuff going on in this one area where the enemies are trying to get us, Nehemiah says, we're going to blow a trumpet in that area. You hear the trumpet, everybody come to where that's at and we're going to fight. Kind of like this royal rumble thing going on. I know, wrestling, spandex, it's all happening in Nehemiah. So... Let's, let's just process through what we just read. It's this dance again. The wall's starting to be rebuilt. Nehemiah has this big team doing small specific roles. Everybody's getting excited. The opponents, though, in those first three verses, they were angry, they ridiculed, and they humiliated the workers. You guys are silly. I mean, if this thing, you're not going to build this. Out of all this rubble, how do you think you're going to do this? And you're here working, trying to do this. How do you think you're possibly going to do this? There's no way that this will get done. What's Nehemiah's response? Here's the dance. The first thing he did wasn't, yeah, we'll take a brick and... What's his response? He took it to God. He prayed. They're ridiculing and humiliating. Nehemiah says, I took it to God and I began to pray. And guess what we did after the prayer was done? Basically, we ignored them and we continued building. The opponents go away? No. No. Verse 7, here they come back again. The opponents now, they're angry, and they plotted to fight against the workers. So our threats and kind of making fun of you didn't work. Now we're going to threaten your life. We're going to fight you. We're going to beat you up. So what was Nehemiah's response is the next part. Nehemiah prayed. He took it to God, and then his response was, we need to set up some guards. We need to protect ourselves. We, we, we got the trumpet to kind of rally the troops together. The opponents get mad. They start ridiculing, making fun. Nehemiah took it to God. And then they just kept working. Now they got violent and started threatening. Nehemiah immediately took it to God, prayed. Then he said, I need to set up some protection. I want to make sure that my workers are being safe and that everything's okay. I want to be smart too. I want to be wise because these guys are coming and, and they're threatening us. So he prayed. He responded. He prayed. He took action. Now in chapter 5, just as a highlight, we're not going to read it. But chapter 5 then, Nehemiah, I don't know if it's like almost he had some time as the work's going on, and he started looking around, and he started hearing some complaints. And he started looking into some things, and he saw there was some sin in the house. There was some unethical practices and things that were going on, and this is just a very loose kind of idea of what's going on in chapter 5. And Nehemiah looked within the house, and, and in my words, he kind of looked around and said, Brothers, sisters, there is sin in this house, and it needs dealt with. If we're going to truly become and be the people that God wants us to be, we need to root out the sin that's here. We need to take care of business. And whether that's a self-reflection, for them that was kind of a big public, some, 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 some unethical practices that were going on. And then la the latter part of five details uh, some of the self-sacrifice of Nehemiah, things he was willing to give up, things that he was willing to set aside of his own personal rights so that this work could get done. And so that's what five's about. And it's an important part. There's really a whole nother, a whole nother, there I did it. I haven't said that in a long time. Another whole sermon that could be just on chapter five about sin that's in the house. 
What sin do we need to look at within our own selves and our own hearts? And sometimes we start to wonder, like, God, why is all this opposition here? And sometimes it's because I've, I'm meddling in my own sin. I don't want to hear that. I just want to hear all the good stuff. So we need to examine ourselves a little bit too. But we're going to get back to the dance of the opponents in chapter 6. So you have chapter 5 dealing with that. Now watch chapter 6. We're going to read uh, 14 verses here. I want, to, I want to hear that and again just highlight what's going on here of this dance. But watch, watch the dance that's happening. It really starts with the but now. But now, chapter 6 verse 1. When Sembalad and Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, the rest of our enemies, heard that I had built the wall, there was no breach left in it. Although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come, let's meet together at, uh, I always tell you, just fly through these. Wow, that, I wasn't ready for that one. Ha- hacker for him. That, excuse me. In the plain of Ono, but they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in the same way, and I answered them in the same manner. Kept sending me messages. Come on, come on, we want to meet with you. We want to meet. Verse 5, in the same way, Sam Ballett, for the fifth time, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you're building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become the king. And you've also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear of these reports. So now come, let us take counsel together. And I sent to him saying, no such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O God, strengthen my hands. Verse 10, now when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mahitabel, he w- who was confined to, to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they're coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away, and what such as I go, could go into the temple and live, I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way in sin, and so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. Now watch, there's this dance going on again. Same thing was going on in four, now it's in six. So how does it begin in the first couple of verses? It's the opponents just saying, listen, let's meet together. We want to have a meeting with you. You know, we really, this is, we've had problems, I want to meet with you. In wisdom, in prayer, Nehemiah said, no. And number two, and I love this, we're going we're gonna to pick this up in a, in a bit. He said, I am involved in a great work, and I cannot come down and meet with you. So they kept sending messengers, kept sending messengers. No, 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 I'm not coming. Then it's, it's the attacks again. We're going to start making stuff up about you. Listen, Nehemiah, we know the truth is this. This is really about you. You're building this wall because once it's finished, you're going to set yourself up as king and we're going to go tell on you. We know that you've already got people ready to proclaim the new king is in town. Nehemiah is here. We know what you're really doing. What does Nehemiah say? (laughs) That's not even true. He ignored it and he kept on working. Now, I I realize it's been like a good seven days since I've talked about Brett Favre, but obviously we're all thinking the same thing. So... So Brett re- retires kind of from Green Bay, goes to New York, kind of retires again, goes to Minnesota. Coming out of Minnesota the first year, all the rumors and everything's going again. Is he coming back? Is he not coming back? And there was this great scene that I saw of debating about what's he doing, what's he not doing. I think he just literally finished up his Levi commercial or Wranglers or whatever, he, whatever he wears. He's getting in his truck bunch of reporters sitting there wanting to know. I'm watching this on ESPN. They put a microphone in his face as he's trying to close the door of his truck and they put it right in his face. And they say, what do you have to say about the fact that you're holding out for, or Minnesota says you're holding out for more money. 
And that's why you're not coming back. And I absolutely loved his response, not just because it's Brett Favre. But he looked right at the camera and he said, number one, that's not true. And number two, I don't even believe Minnesota said that. And he shut his, the door of his truck and he drove off. And it got me thinking, how much of our news is just making stuff up to get a response out of you? And now you look stupid. And now Brett's like, what, Minnesota said that? Well, I'm mad at them and I'm upset. That's exactly what we're trying to do. What do you have to say about this? We know that you're really just trying to set yourself up as a king. That's what everybody's saying. I mean, he could have, it's not in the text, but maybe they said it like that. You, you know, this is what the workers are saying about you right now. What, are you kidding me? Those people that I've been helping and lead, are they say that about me? I'm going to get them. And that's how it starts happening. And we get duped and tricked into that. Nehemiah saw right through it. Why? Because I think part of the core was he was always responding in prayer. And he said, that's not even true. And he kept working. How many of us even right now, we might even be this minute lingering on something that somebody said to us and it's got us all riled up. I can't believe that that person said it. Here, take this just for maybe food for thought. They might not even have said it. Has, has anyone ever, I don't, I don't want to hear it, but has, has anyone... Has anyone had a situation that you know of that I I had something in my mind that I just knew somebody did against me, said against me, and then I found out it wasn't even true. It wasn't even true. My favorite one on that, it just popped into my brain, so I'll give it to you for free, but I'm sitting at a a little cafe in Malone when I was a student there. Now, I'd been there long enough to know that it's Froggy's Cafe. I don't, it's something else now, but when you walk from the outside, it's one of those mirror window things that you cannot see on the inside. When you're on the outside, you can't see in, you know, those, but when you're on the inside, you can see clearly the outside. I'm sitting with somebody at the table and they're like, hey, hey, there's my friend. And that jerk didn't even wave to me. And I said to them, I said, go outside, right? And they said, why? I said, go outside right now and tell me how many fingers I'm holding up. I didn't put a, (laughs) I said, how many fingers am I holding up? They came back in and go, boy, I'm an idiot. Yeah, they didn't even see you. But if I wasn't here, I wonder if you'd have spent the rest of the day thinking, I can't believe so-and-so's not talking to me. I'm going to be all mad. I'm not talking to them now. Next thing you know, you're in a whole fight. And it was your wife walking by, you know, like... How many times is that happening? That's exactly what was happening here. Sometimes we need wisdom, we need patience, we need peace, and we certainly need to sit back and pray. So what did Nehemiah do? He dismissed the false reports, he prayed to God, and just kept on working. Now the last thing that they did in the text that we read was his opponents actually hired somebody to trick Nehemiah into hiding in the sanctuary. So this prophet priest kind of guy comes up to Nehemiah. Listen, they're coming to get you. You need to get into the sanctuary, get into the church. It's kind of like the whole uh, hunchback of Notre Dame, Quasimodo kind of thing. If you can proclaim sanctuary and you can get into the church, they can't get you. So come on, let's get you out of here. Let's get you safe. Nehemiah again took it to God. He prayed through wisdom. He saw this is a trick. This is a trick. You've been hired by these opponents to try to trick me to get into the church. I mean, what would the people, knowing that they're working amongst all this opposition, do? if they, where's, where's Nehemiah? Where's our fearless leader? He's hiding in the, in the church. Nehemiah said, no, no. He saw through their lies. I refuse to leave. And he prayed. And he prayed, God, God, you do what you need to do with these opponents of mine. Remember me for, for the faithfulness I've tried to have. Another guy I really like, this reminded me totally of something that happened in his life, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, pastor, uh, author, preacher, one of, one of my favorites. When, when he, was, he was a part of a movement of, of, you know, of Christians, of pastors, at the time of Germany and Hitler, to actually work a plan to assassinate Hitler. A group of pastors and people meeting. So you talk about some serious heat that's going around. Nehemiah's friends said to him, or, uh, Bonhoeffer's friends said to him, you can read about this in, in one, his biography, uh, in some of the books about him. We, we need to get you out of here. You, you're too important to this work. The things you're writing, the things you're doing, we need to get you out of here and get you to the United States, get you safe. And then one day when this stuff settles down, we'll bring you back in. And then you can continue doing the things you're doing here. You know what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said? I don't, well, I don't know exactly what he said, but he said something to the effect of, you're crazy. You're absolutely crazy. I will not flee and protect my life knowing that when I come back, 
there will be people who've lost loved ones and family. How could I show my face back in this place? I need to stay here, and I need to be a part of this work. Do you know the rest of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's story? He was arrested because of being found out that he's a part of these plots and these plans. And Nehemiah was killed. Or Dietrich Bonhoeffer was killed. He could have saved his life and gone to the United States. But he said, absolutely not. I will stay here and be a part of this work. I'll be a part of what's going on. That's exactly what Nehemiah said. I'm not going to flee from my safety right now because I am involved in a great work and I'm going to stay here. See, spend some time with the dance of four, five, and six, especially four and six. Spend some time with chapter five, examining sin in our lives. See what God's saying to you. I I just want to make four brief, quickly, observations, challenges for us to consider, things that really hit me. Number one, nothing moved him. Nothing moved him. And I believe that comes from those first three chapters. Once his vision, once his God-given vision was set in his heart, nothing moved him. Nothing. Oh, I, 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 I don't have the text. I hate doing this, but I'm going to do it. I hate quoting something that I don't have the, the reference for, but I don't remember where it's at in the Gospels, but it just popped into my head. Do you remember when, when Jesus, there's a time when Jesus is, is explaining to the disciples what's about to happen and he's going to go to the cross and I'm going to be killed in a horrific kind of way. This is a very loose interpretation of it. And Peter looks at Jesus and he says, not on my watch, I've got your back. I'll stop them. And Jesus looks right at Peter and he says, what? Get behind me, Satan. For you don't have in mind the things of God. You have in mind the things of men. Jesus was, if you read Luke in particular, on his way to Jerusalem, going to Jerusalem, everything was his focus and his passion. And once that was set, nothing, even one of my closest friends, a disciple, would not stand in my way. Now, I don't recommend if somebody stands in your God-given vision, you look at them and say, get behind me, Satan. I don't recommend that. But but you need to know clearly your God-given vision too. A lot of people, again, do the whole, like, I went to Taco Bell late at night, I started writing, I had a vision from God. It was really just indigestion, and, it's, and you didn't balance it all out. A lot of people do that kind of stuff. Once, if you've done the work, if you've done the chapters 1 to 3, and your God-given vision is set in your heart, I know beyond the shadow of a doubt, I feel so moved and so compelled. For, for me, it looks like this. When I, when I spend time with something, it's a lot of time. I believe ministry is a marathon. I'm not here in a sprint. I mean, it's almost 18 years that we've been here. So you come up with some new idea. I, I'll listen, but I realize we'll be here next year maybe, and, and we'll, we'll do it then. But it's got to take time. But for me, once it gets set in my heart, here's how I know I'm ready. It doesn't matter to me if anyone else shows up in February for TLC. I'll be here I'm making my wife come. I mean, she wants to be here, but we'll be here together and we're going to study this book. We're going to put these things into our lives that God has put on my heart to do and I'm ready. So you can tell me it's stupid. You don't like it. You don't like the name. We should, I, I don't care what you say. It's set in my heart now. I've spent a lot of time with it and I'm ready. And I know that I'm ready because it doesn't matter if I, no one else shows up. I'm ready. And it'll be whatever God wanted it to be. Once you get that God-given vision, You've spent the real due diligence taking time. For Nehemiah, once that was set, nothing moved him. Nothing. Nothing. The second thing, and I love this, that uh, chapter 6, verse 3, I think it was, he knew his great work. How, How could he possibly move and stop? Because this was his great work. So if one other couple shows up to TLC and that's it, I'm not going to sit around and say, well, this stinks. Only, only one other person came. I'm going to think, no, this is my great work. I've been with Sarah for, uh, I, my mind is all over in mind, 20, 18, I don't know where we've been, 18, 20, 20 some years, 20, 17 years of marriage coming up and 20, 20, 22, 23 years we've been together, dating, been together. We fight all the time. But I absolutely love being married. I love Sarah. I love everything about it. I, I, it's hard to do weddings sometimes. Forgive me for those of you who are engaged in the room and I'm going to do your wedding maybe in the next year. I will love your wedding. The others, they get difficult. But why do I, why am I passionate about it? 
Because if I can have a moment to speak into your life and your marriage, maybe something will take place, something will get rooted, and you will love this too. And when you face with a bad, tough decision, maybe you'll choose to, to try to hang in there just a little longer. Just fight through it a little bit. I love it. Absolutely love it. So I get caught up in the whole romantic idealism and things of it? Yes, I do. But there's a grounded, boring part of it. My, the couple today is going to hear in front of all their family and friends that there are boring days to marriage. And most of marriage is lived out, not in the Hollywood kind of things, not what you're reading in the magazines and the, in, in the giant eagle lines. That's not the day-to-day marriage. It's lived out in boring days. I know that's one of my great works. I know that's what I'm passionate about. You want to you wanna ask me to be in like 28 uh, fantasy football, softball, baseball, soccer, golf, whatever leagues? I'm not going to do it right now because I have another great work that I'm so passionate about. And that's I'm a dad. There are three little kids that call me daddy. None of you get to call me daddy. You can call me father if you want to. That's fine. Uh, you don't call me daddy. I got three at home that call me daddy. And so if I'm faced with a decision that I got to make between them and, and, and you, I'm sorry, I'm choosing them every time. Every time. It's them. That doesn't give me excuses. It's just I don't do work all day long, you know. But I know my great work. I know my great work. The question is, do you know your great work? Do you know your passion? Do you know what your God-given vision is? Things that just get you going. And nothing should get in the way of that. We live so much by accident, and we just let so many things happen. And then, and then I think that's why then on, on the other end of life, I, a, great, a great work of mine, something I love to do, is kneeling at the bedsides of people who are leaving this earth. It's, it's a weird kind of great work to a lot of people. But there's a lot of times I'm in those conversations and I'm dealing with and helping people reconcile with regret in their lives. And part of that reason is because I think years ago they never understood what their great work was and they spent their whole life living on on other people's dreams and works and being pulled in every direction. And the next thing they know, they blinked and every kid was out of their house and then they looked at their spouse and they didn't even know who their spouse was anymore. I, 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 for another spouse, TLC people, the, the, your, part of the requirement is going to be date, a monthly date. I can't believe how many couples don't date anymore. It's a monthly date. It's a requirement. Let me define a date for you. No kids, no couples that you like to hang out with or don't like to hang out with. A date is, I know this sounds weird, just you and you together looking at each other. I should make a mandate of no phones too. That's a date. I'm going to tell you, you all won't respect if you need a meeting with me that I say, I can't meet with you right now. I know you got this big crisis going on in your life, but I have a date with Sarah planned. Are you kidding me? Like my life's falling apart. You're going to go out with your wife and eat like a couple of dollar cheeseburgers or something? Come on. So guess what I tell you? I lie. You know what? I can't. I have a meeting tonight because I will not let you get in the way of my great work. And one of my first great works is I'm Sarah's husband. Not another person in this world, I don't think, can claim that they are Sarah's husband. I am Sarah's husband. That's my great work. So go ahead and try to disrupt my date night. Try it. What is your great work? What is it? Think about it. What's your, what are you passionate about? That's where all the vision stuff comes. And once it's set, nothing will move you from it. And you will know your great work and you'll be involved in that. Number three, and now I'm speculating on this one. But he had to be really, really good at forgiveness. He had to. And the reason I'm speculating on it is because of all the attacks, all the false accusations, all the words. I know as a leader, I know as someone who's been a part of ministry and working with people for almost 20 years now with with one other place I was at before this, I know that it can become very, very, very hard after almost 20 years of listening to constructive criticism of people. And if you don't intentionally deal with forgiveness, bitterness, anger, you won't be a good person to be around. Nehemiah had to be really, really good at forgiveness because these guys were coming at him hard. And some people will do it intentionally. Some people be mean. Some people are just, they're just buttheads. Some people are just having a really bad day and you happen to walk in and they took it out on you. I've been to a marriage conference 
that did this. I was at a pastor's seminar that did this. The pastor's seminar was great. He didn't tell us what it was going to be. Build it up. He said, listen, do not miss the last session. I have something really, really important we need to talk about. It's the most important thing I can tell you. Please don't miss this last session. Come into the last session. And he goes, this is what I tell you. Get really, really good at forgiveness because you're going to need it. People are just mean. People are mean. People are mean. I came across this quote and I absolutely love it. What can a wicked person do to him who carries the saber of forgiveness in his hand? You can't possibly hurt or harm me if I carry the sword of forgiveness in my hand. You come at me with the word, I forgive you. (laughs) You're a big jerk, I forgive you. And I walk away, it's like, it's awesome, I love it. You know, I mean, it's like, so I can do the fatherly, priestly kind of thing. Hey, hey, father, you're a big, what? Forgive you. And then I walk away. Seriously, think about it. What can anyone possibly do to you? When you're so mad, you're so upset, isn't the core of it often, I can't forgive somebody. But if I carry with me the saber of forgiveness, forgiven. Wow, suddenly I'm not, I don't have anxiety, I'm not upset, I'm not walking around steaming all day long, I'm not, I'm not all scrunched up, I'm not angry, I'm not this. And the other person that did whatever they did to me, they're out back at Geauga Lake having fun, riding roller coasters. They didn't even know. How many of us are struggling with that? Now, now I realize some of us are struggling with really, really big kinds of things that we need to forgive, and I don't make light of that at all. A lot of us sometimes just need to, like, seriously, get, like, you should have got over that 28 years ago. I don't know anything that happened in anyone's lives 28 years ago. So if that's specifically you, please, I, I just made that number up. But if, if I hit your year, uh, there's a reason for that. That's, profe- that's something. That's something. You've got to be good at forgiveness. Got it. I love, I love, sorry, this is a side one. We're gonna, I'm wrapping up, I promise. But um, I love when you watch like the, well, don't get offended when I'm saying this, but I, I, when you get like the, the TV preachers, you get the TV preachers and there is someone out there who has cancer. He's talking to me. Like, you know how many people have cancer? I mean, that, there is someone out there who has dealing with an issue of unforgiveness. God has spoke this to me. Are you kidding me? I bet you every person in this room has or is currently dealing with some little area of unforgiveness and bitterness in our hearts. You've got to attack it. It's the art of forgiving. Unforgiveness, another quote, is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. But you can't touch me if I'm an expert at forgiveness. I I can tell you, I do some stuff with this that I intentionally practice almost literally every single day. Because in my field, in my particular world, I'm around pastors who have been in the game a long time. And there's some that I look at and I think, Lord, please don't let that be me. They didn't deal with forgiveness. And I don't want to become that. There are people in any sort of business that work with people that I don't want to be that person. Because they have not practiced and mastered the art of forgiving. And you actually can get pretty good at practicing just forgiving. Forgiving. But it takes discipline. It's not callous, like, you're forgiven, and then you're angry. It's not. You can actually develop daily habitual practice. Let me give you one hint where where most of it's found. It is daily disciplining yourself to get in this word and pray. What did Nehemiah do every single time he was faced with opposition? He took it to God. Somebody hurts you today, if your first response is to go within and just get mad and angry and upset and rehearse all the different ways I would get them and I can't believe they said this. It's like George Costanza and the jerk store. If you know Seinfeld at all, he was rehearsing in his mind forever. I'm going to get him back and I'm going to use jerk store on him. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. But it's a guy who spent months consumed with how I'm going to get somebody back. But if your first response to opposition and somebody hurts you is to immediately take it to God. God, right now, I want to hurt them. I want them to be hurt. And I need your help right now. If you immediately start developing those kinds of habits and practices, it gets really easy at some point to wield the saber of forgiveness. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. Go into like the Mayo Clinic uh, website. 
Type in forgiveness. Type in and see some of the symptoms. See some of the negative effects that it has, unforgiveness has on our bodies. So you want to practice a good New Year's resolution of like taking care of yourself? Start practicing forgiveness. Read it. It's, it's, it's very interesting. Number four and the last one. He, he took everything to God. We've been talking about it throughout. Anything that happened, Nehemiah took it to God. What are the challenges, I think, for us to consider? Number one, get your vision so set in your heart. A true God-given vision. Not just you being a butthead and thinking, this is what I want to do, and I don't care what anyone thinks. Get it set, and once you do, nothing moves you. You will know your great work, and you've got to be really, really good at forgiveness, I think. And the way you do all that is take it all to God. Take it all to God. Beginning, middle, and end. Take it to God. Take it to God. Take it to God. So, last question on my part for this. What is your great work? What is your great work? This cannot be answered in a day, and it should not be answered in a day. If you've not done any part of a process, don't answer it. But begin to go back to chapters 1 and 3. Get the notes. Start looking at how do I develop a vision for my life. Think of the process of Nehemiah. It comes out of a burden. It comes out of a passion, a desire. It's prayer, fasting. It's listening. It's watching. It's, watching. it's not getting ahead of God. It's, it's developed through hard work, intentional planning, careful communication, and then getting a team of help and whatever, wherever you need. Um, um, current REM guys. This is exactly what the life plan has been that we've been spending a year doing. Asking ourselves questions about what is your values, what is your passions, who do you want to be remembered by, what will people say at your funeral, writing and noting these things so that at the end of this year, you'll develop a life vision that says, this is what my great work is. This is what I'm about. And once you get to that point of this intentional kinds of process, nothing will keep you from your great work and you'll actually know your great work. Now, as I said, this is a part three of four. I felt we needed some good home-style Italian cooking to bring us home next week. So I've invited Vince next Sunday morning, I hope you'll be here, to take the series home. And we're going to be in chapter eight. The rest of the story in Nehemiah is pretty cool. So if you pick right up at verse 15 where we've left off and all the stuff that's happened, it says the wall's finished. The wall was done. Nothing kept him from his great work and they completed the wall. In chapter 7, more exiles were able to return home. Chapter 8 is all about we need to, people, rededicate our lives to this book. And that's what 8 focuses a lot about. It's, one of, it's got chapter 8, verse 10. Vince and I is one of our favorite verses. And, and then it ends with uh, some dedications of the wall and some reforms that are going to be made. Read the rest of Nehemiah. Spend some time considering what is your great work. And it might just start with one question. Have you decided to follow Jesus? Has there been a point in your life where you said, I have decided to follow Jesus, and though no one go with me, I still, I will follow. It's really rooted in that. Ben, why don't you guys start coming up? If this morning... If you've never made a personal decision for Jesus and you say, you know what, today is that day. I, I just, I've been, I, I know that there, that's the part that's missing. I would love to have an opportunity to pray with you, to talk with you. If it's not this morning or up here, then, then another time. If you want to come forward and pray and just be up here and praying by yourself, that's that side. I won't bother you over there. But if you want to come up, if I could pray with you, if it's about something about rededication, about, your, about my walk with Christ, I'm dealing with unforgiveness, bitterness right now. We don't bra- broadcast this stuff. Nobody knows what we're talking about. You th- they think you're just up here asking me about bread or something like that. I mean, nobody knows. But if you want to pray about something, if something I could pray with you, another elder in the church, somebody in the church, please, please. Have you decided to follow Jesus? Do you know what your great work is? Have you spent time intentionally planning and carefully looking at your vision? If there's things related to any of that that you want to pray about, please, I invite you to do that today or sometime later today or this week. Don't wait on that stuff. It's time. I'm perfect timing. I finished again right on time. All right, let's pray. Why don't you guys, we'll get ready. Actually stand and then we'll pray. We'll sing. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all that you have done and continue to do for us in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the great work that you've done in our lives. Thank you for the invitation that you extend to us through Christ. We give you all the praise and all the glory, Father. Father, I pray here today that there's not a person in this room that couldn't walk out today to say, you know what? I have decided to follow Jesus. Nothing else matters around me. I've decided to follow Jesus. 
And I pray, Father, a, a protection. If there's obstacles, if there's opposition, if there's people coming at us, if there's bitterness, anger, there's things that we need healing from, I pray for that through the power and the working of your Holy Spirit. Father, we, we give you our lives. I, I pray that this would be a church that just recklessly abandons our lives into the arms of our Heavenly Father, desiring to be disciples and slaves of Jesus Christ. Today, Father, we give you all the praise and all the glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.